The Beast of the Field Part 2 by K.B. Hurst Chapter 5 Joshua sauntered up the long flight of stairs to the front door. He took out the key to his front door to unlock it when it opened seemingly on its own. Anthony was out of bed. Why was he out of bed? Joshua thought it odd, but also annoying. I need to go out. Now? Joshua asked. Yes, now. Anthony looked at his brother in a sort of helpless resentment. You shouldn't be out of bed. What part of I need to leave don't you fucking understand? I need to see Dr. Phillips to see if he can give me more pain pills. Finally, Joshua understood, and he let his brother pass him. The thought of tripping him down the long flight of stairs from the porch thrilled him, but he thought better of it. He knew Joshua would find a way to survive that accident, too. Tracy sat studying with Miguel, and their combined efforts were being utilized like some superpower to help her understand her trig homework. The two best friends sat for a long time, and then Tracy finally grew tired. Her long blonde hair was in a messy bun on top of her head, and the bags under her eyes told Miguel she had not slept again. Uh, I say we call it a night. I'll walk you back to your dorm. No, go ahead without me. I'll be fine. It's only a few minutes walk. Miguel smiled at her, and then he left her as she packed her things up. Chapter 6 The sun was already going down as Joshua watched the street lamps come on. He drove to Dr. Phillips' office and secretly wished they'd admit his brother so he could have one restful evening alone in their big family homestead. Anthony watched as people walked to and fro down the street. They stopped at a red light. Then he saw Tracy as she crossed in front of them. <laughs> She's pretty. What? Joshua pretended to ignore his brother. It was too late. The girl he had set his eyes on months ago now had his brother's full attention. The light turned green, and he saw Tracy run towards the dorm building. <sighs> I want her blood. After we get home, go find her. It looks like she lives in Ketchum Hall. The young... Pretty and vivacious ones always taste better than the old crows. <laughs> Joshua was angry now, but he couldn't let his brother know. Tracy was the one he would save her for himself. He spent hours fantasizing about her. Now, his reckless, disgusting brother wanted her for himself. This was not acceptable. Joshua pulled into the parking lot of the doctor's office. He helped his brother out of the vehicle and then went into the office with him. He let his brother talk to the receptionist, and he found a chair to sit in. He watched as the receptionist explained that he could only be seen with an appointment. Joshua heard his brother getting loud and argumentative. Finally, Dr. Phillips came out to meet Anthony. Anthony went into the doctor's office, and Joshua waited. <sighs> Anthony, I can only give you a prescription for 30 days. And it has to only have been two weeks. And you want me to get in trouble with the medical board? It hurts, doctor. My entire body is riddled with cancer. <laughs> Look, I can give you an additional week. But you must only take two a day. That's one in the morning and one in the evening. That works. Thank you. Dr. Phillips gave in the week-long script, and Anthony was satisfied. Dr. Phillips noticed that he had yellowish teeth and a white face. He looked malnourished, so he made a note for someone to do a wellness check on him without anyone knowing. Maybe his brother needed to be treating him right. Anthony walked out of Dr. Phillips' office with a sly mark on his face. Joshua knew his brother had gotten his way, and Anthony always got his way. The two young men got into Joshua's car and then drove home. When they got home, Joshua got out of the vehicle when Anthony stopped him. <laughs> you aren't done. I need that pretty girl's blood. How else will I get better? 
Don't come back till you get it. Anthony got out of the car, slammed the door, and then slowly made the trip up the front steps of their house. Joshua stood looking at his brother from the vehicle. He didn't want to help him up the steps, but when he saw Anthony stumble, he had no choice but to quietly assist as his foot glided up the steps, nearly tripping. Leave me and go find my blood, Anthony said with a wicked smile. I don't want to. It might get more notice if she goes missing right after the last one. They are still asking questions at the bar where she worked. I heard the detective last time I was in there. Anthony rolled his eyes. Just find me some blood. How will I ever get better if I don't feed? Joshua nodded, letting Anthony into the house. His hands shook as he fumbled with the keys. The door opened to a loud creak. We should get that fixed, said Anthony. I will, said Joshua, exhausted. Joshua knew he had maybe hours to find someone for his brother. He knew it couldn't be Tracy. Joshua wanted her for himself. He didn't want to have to do to her what he had done to the last one. This thing with his brother was getting out of hand. It began almost ten years ago. Anthony was attending the same university that Tracy was attending. Part of the fraternity that Anthony was hazing for wanted them to break into the infamous Tomhurst mansion where Dr. Victor Tomhurst lived. Dr. Tomhurst would be out that night. He'd be giving a speech at a fundraiser at the university. It would be the perfect time to get inside, take something of value to prove they had gone to the Tomhurst mansion, then get out as fast as possible. Dr. Tomhurst was rumored to have been a recruit from Germany right after World War II. He was young, very young, but he had learned so much from the doctors and scientists. Once he was granted permission to work in the U.S., he was given free reign to do as he wished. He could experiment using whatever means necessary. He was allotted money from grants for medical experimentation. He had more money than he knew what to do with. The night Anthony broke inside the Tomhurst mansion with his fraternity brothers, he realized that all the rumors were true. Dr. Tomhurst had many things hiding in his laboratory, things that were frightening, to say the least. Anthony was the first inside the secret lab. No alarm sounded, and there were no secret hallways. It was simply a laboratory. Inside, Nothing was, at first, too concerning. That is, until Anthony's friend Mitchell stepped inside. He and Anthony waited for the other boys to follow them. Inside was a dark corner, and a large cage in that dark corner. They slowly stepped over to the cage, and that's when they heard the growling of something that resembled a dog, but had human-like hands. Its face, almost like that of a young man, its eyes were violet with yellowish-red pupils. The young men backed away in horror, only to see several vials on a large table. One of them spelled out, causing the table they sat on to melt through it like acid. They heard another sound, but something was shuffling around on the floor. Mitchell found a light switch near the ground and flipped it on. There, on the floor, was what looked like half of a man, only he was on top of a crab-like body and a, had a slithering tail resembling a crocodile. The young men were scared now, but had to take something to show they had been in Victor Tomhurst's infamous laboratory. Anthony looked around, and the only thing he could find as the others were running out the door was a vial that read, Forever Young. When he returned to the fraternity, they failed to notice Mason. Victor's butler and caretaker, watching them from the darkness of night. When they were gone, Mason called Victor to inform him of a theft. When they returned to the fraternity, Anthony took out the vial and shoved it to one of the brothers. What's this? The young man laughed. I don't know, something from Dr. Tomhurst's lab. Just like you asked. 
Anthony was annoyed now. It just looks like an olive oil file and a some kind of jar with olive oil, dude, said a tall young man named Chase. Chase looked smugly at Anthony. Fine, I'll drink it, said Anthony. The young man all laughed, surrounding Anthony. Anthony, trying to ensure his status in the fraternity, opened the bottle and drank it all down. Chase laughed, smacking Anthony on the back. <laughs> Now what? Chase asked. I don't know. I don't feel any... Oh. Anthony dropped to the floor mid-sentence. He began to shake, and what looked like a seizure. Chase and the others took one look at him and were afraid that maybe they had done something horrible. Anthony became ill almost instantly. He threw up his dinner, and then black goo began to form in his mouth as he regurgitated that, too. Black goo now covered the floor of the fraternity house. Sickened by this, the young men all backed up. Then Anthony screamed and closed his eyes. Thinking he was dead, the young men panicked, dialing 911. Oh my god. Chase took the phone from the guy's hand. We can't. They'll send us all to prison. Jesus. Look, just put him in the back of the car. Let's toss him by the lake. We'll say he went on a bender. Grab some empty bottles. Come on, he demanded. The young men followed suit, and Mitchell was gobsmacked at what had just occurred. Chase grabbed him by his shirt and forced him to help pick up Anthony's limp body. Tossing his body in the back of the vehicle, the five young men drove out to the lake. The lake was part of an abandoned amusement park, so they knew no one would be there. Under a slight crescent moon, the young men staged a scene of drunken debauchery. Tossing Anthony face down near the lake, they poured beer around his body and placed a bottle in his hand, not even considering that it might not work. They staged a scene for someone to find. Chase had one of the other young men drive Anthony's car, so it looked like he had driven himself there. It was a perfect scene. The five young men went about their weekend as if nothing had just happened. They kept waiting for a cop or someone to show up at their door to tell them that they had found Anthony. But the entire week went by, and nothing happened. The following weekend, the five young men were at the frat house watching a basketball game with some other friends when, around midnight, there was a knock at the door. Finding it odd, someone would actually knock and not just walk in, as they were used to, living in a frat house, Chase had Mitchell go open the door. When he did, Mitchell let out an audible gasp. <sighs> Chase laughed. <laughs> Come on, what's going on over there? That is when he has yet to hear a response from Mitchell. Instead, he saw Anthony standing at the door with Mitchell's head in his hand. Chase stood there trying to articulate what was happening, but Anthony was at his side before he could even open his mouth. How did he get to him so quickly? You fucking bastard. You left me to die. Look, we were we were just scared. We, we didn't want to go to jail. For what? You? It was the wrong thing to say, even if it were true. Anthony's eyes were red with hunger. His mouth began to open wide as he turned sideways to bite down on Chase's neck, slashing Chase's throat as blood poured all over him. Anthony's gross hunger only made him feel as though he were starving more as he bit into the other's throats, biting, ripping their necks until he reached their spinal cords. From there, he devoured most of their flesh and bone, savoring each morsel. It was when he satisfied his hunger that he realized what he had done. He had this newfound gift of eternal life and strength, and with it came bloodlust. Anthony felt like he could just live forever. Only, whatever was in the formula also caused Anthony to become deathly ill after. The slaughter of the frat house boys was a mystery never solved. Animals must have done it according to the press. Anthony became a recluse afterward. 
He had to tell Josh about it, and when he did, Josh wanted to be just like Anthony, to feel invincible and become forever like him. But Anthony knew he could no longer hunt. Not like this. That never ended well. Sooner or later, authorities would find out. The only drawback was that Anthony now needed blood to sustain himself or he would die. He had gone to the doctor to find out what was wrong with him, besides the obvious. He'd grow ill within hours after eating. It was cancer. He had had it for a couple of years, even before his gift of eternal life. The issue was it could not be cured by chemo. Doctors gave him a month to live, but had no idea how he would just keep going. The formula kept Anthony in a permanent state, so he was sick, so that meant he was in a permanent state of illness. He would not die from it, not a human death, but rather die a little every day, and if he got the flesh he needed, it would make him better for about 48 hours. Then he would grow sick again. The sickness had to be the worst. His bones broke. His eyes blurred. He'd choke on his own vomit. But with drugs, it slowed the process. A good dose of tramadol, and he was good as new, until his hunger grew impatient. His appetite grew over time, and more and more he sought out Josh's help getting victims. The newspaper was filled with missing persons nearly every day. Dr. Tom Hurst knew it was the formula he had created. In his effort to study human behavior, he made a formula to help him understand desire. It was never meant to be used on anyone. He had given it to rats. The formula had a very odd side effect that gave way to the feeling of eternal life. It made the rats almost young after they devoured blood. The second they didn't have it, they would regress into older and sickly rats. Dr. Tom Hurst was now busy creating a new creature that would challenge the evil devourer of victims. But it was only a matter of time before the beast arrived. It was as if a scream had devoured her again. Tracy woke in a sweat so intense she had to shower. She changed her bedding too, but it was too late. She was up for the day. Tracy felt it might be time to see a doctor. She had not slept in months, and her dreams were getting worse. So she sought a doctor from her university directory. Tracy made an appointment for that afternoon because someone had canceled. Sitting in the waiting room, she heard voices coming from the office behind the receptionist. It sounded like an older man and another man talking about brain waves and theory. Tracy saw one of the men step out, smiling at her. Tracy? She looked up at the man and then noticed the other man. He was elderly and a bit dressed up. The doctor introduced himself. Hi, I'm Dr. Crabtree and this is my friend Dr. Tom Hurst. He was just giving me a hard time about the lack of patience on a Monday. Dr. Crabtree smiled. Tracy grinned at them both and Dr. Tom Hurst bid goodbye. He stood by the receptionist talking to her as Tracy was directed to Dr. Crabtree's office. Sitting down, Dr. Crabtree talked to her a bit of, to try and make her first visit comfortable. He told her a bit about himself and asked Tracy some questions about herself. It helped remove the awkwardness so that Tracy could speak freely about what was bothering her. After a few moments, Tracy found herself telling Dr. Crabtree about her lack of sleep and the nightmares causing it. Dr. Crabtree listened intently as she told him about the beast and getting chased. She felt so at ease with him, she didn't mind telling him about the fears that it had created, especially with all the missing women in the area. Just outside the door, Dr. Tom Hurst was about to leave when he heard Tracy tell Dr. Crabtree that she was frightened about the missing young women. That piqued Dr. Tom Hurst's interest. Dr. Crabtree was concerned as many doctors would be, and prescribed some sleep medication for her. Dr. Crabtree told her to start writing down her dreams 
As dreams often symbolize some part of ourselves that are not recognized by the conscious mind, he set up another appointment for the following week, and Tracy went on her way. She felt better, knowing there was some help to this madness, after all. As she passed the receptionist's de desk, she noticed Dr. Tomhurst was still standing there chatting up the receptionist, who was laughing. Dr. Tomhurst caught wind of Tracy walking by and told her to have a nice day. When Tracy was out the door, Dr. Tomhurst excused himself from the receptionist and entered Dr. Crabtree's office. You're still here? Judy will not get any work done for me with you standing there talking her ear off. Oh, beautiful women enchant me, even for an older man. But it isn't what I came to talk to you about. What is it, then? I apologize, Martin, but that young lady that just went out... I didn't mean to eavesdrop on patient doctor privilege, but I heard her mention the missing women... Do you think she might know more than what she lets on? Dr. Crabtree rolled his eyes. You are very king, but I cannot tell you that. Even if I thought she might know more than she's letting on, legalities must be withheld. <laughs> yes, yes, I know. I just have a gut feeling. Did she happen to say where she was headed after? Class? Dr. Tomhurst chuckled. <laughs> Class indeed. To be continued. <laughs>